All right, everyone, thank you again for joining us. As I mentioned, my name is Jenny Erickson. I'm the Senior Director of Enrollment Management here at the University of Chicago. I'm so happy that you are joining us today for this session. You are in for a great treat. We're very lucky to have um, Professor Wright here. Um, I'll give a brief overview and then we'll turn it over. So Professor Wright is an Assistant Professor of Public Policy here at the University of Chicago. And he his research focuses on sub-state conflict and political economy of insurgent violence, examining how re rebel groups adopt new technologies of war to undermine state rivals. He also studies the political economy of crime and pandemic response. For those of you here today, I think it's helpful for you to know that Professor Wright also teaches in the Applied Statistics Corps at Harris, so you're an admitted incoming student and you feel very excited about stats or very nervous about stats. This is sometimes helpful to get a sense of how our faculty approach research and what they think about. And Professor Wright also is the um, faculty director for our data and policy summer scholar program. So those of you here interested in that topic, I think you will also find this session helpful. I also want to note that Professor Wright has received numerous awards for his teaching and we have a lot of graduate assistants that are in our office and they'll tell us, you know, often that they were nervous about stats, but they felt so much better and they enjoyed Professor Wright's class so much. He um, won the 2017 Junior Faculty of the Year Award at Harris and he was selected to give the last lecture um, for the 2021 graduating class. So you're in for a, a great session tonight. Okay, Professor Wright, I'll turn it over to you. Well, Jenny, thanks for that, that incredibly generous introduction. I'm really excited to, to see so many folks in the audience. Um, and, you know, really, it'll be an opportunity, hopefully, for me to share some of the work that, that I've been doing, but this is ongoing work. And so I'm very curious to hear your perspectives as well. Um, if you have ideas, if you have questions, um, it, it's often conversations like this where we can think about ways that we can refine the work that, that uh, we do. And, you know, one thing I, I also want to highlight is the, the work that we're about to talk about um, can be politically sensitive in nature. I think, you know, what I would encourage us to do is to think about this largely in an apolitical way. We're studying a phenomena uh, that in many ways uh, is a foundation for an anti-democratic movement in the United States, whether or not we necessarily want to characterize it that way. Um, but it's also the foundation for an ongoing um, political investigation. So it's a, an investigation happening with Congress. And the work I'm about to show you is actually work that is gonna be entered into the congressional record um, as, as a set of findings uh, that motivate the work that's been done on uh, the January 6th event. So again, thanks for, thanks for being here. Please, if you have thoughts, if you have questions, you know, write them down and put them in the chat uh, and hopefully we have a chance to talk about them. So I'm gonna go ahead and screen share now. Is that all right, Jenny? Excellent, all right. And then we'll go ahead and we'll get started. All right, so so this is a this is a paper, um, a part of a part of a large set of projects um, on how we can use big data uh, to study really important topics in public policy. Um, how we can leverage big data uh, to think about both public policy challenges uh, as well as opportunities for us to think about enduring questions uh, in social science as well. Uh, this project is joined with David Van Deka, who is a PhD student at the University of Michigan, uh, a truly phenomenal student uh, that I've had an opportunity now to work with on several projects. Um, what I'm going to show you is the first iteration of, of this particular project, um, and I'm happy to talk about extensions that we've been working on as well. All right, so, so a little bit about motivation, perhaps um, just by the title, you have a sense of what we're going to be talking about. Um, but this particular project is focused on the idea of uh, studying the rise of domestic extremism in the United States. And so uh, this type of extremism and other forms of militia activity, uh, including anti-state violence, uh, actually experienced a surge uh, during the Trump administration. So it reached its highest level um, during that administration, both in terms of its share of overall violence, domestic uh, political violence in the United States, as well as its highest level uh, since 1995. Um, and and that's, a, that's a benchmark year because 1995 was the, the year of the Oklahoma City bombing, uh, another form of anti-state violence. Um, and so the what has been called the March to Save America rally, um, otherwise I think known to, to most folks as the insurrection, um, this is an event that escalated into a violent riot. And this particular event actually links together several movements. So 
uh, a movement of conspiracy theorists, um, QAnon, as well as white supremacy groups like the Proud Boys, as well as pro-Trump organizations such as the Stop the Steal uh, movement. And so this rally that turned into a riot uh, is gonna bind these two together. Um, and the, this particular event is an opportunity to study the role of partisanship, of polarization, of, of hate groups, and of social media in shaping the rise of anti-state violence uh, in the United States. And, and hopefully you get a sense of like, the, the way that we've approached this particular project is gonna make the findings relevant more broadly and not just specific to the United States. And so we, what we worked on in this study is uh, we started off by developing a novel approach for estimating what we call spatially dispersed community level participation in mass protests. Basically, this is a, is a mouthful way of saying that what we've come up with is uh, a tool for identifying whether or not members of particular communities across the United States participated in protest events. And we're gonna apply this methodology. So we're gonna apply this tool uh, to the March to Save America event in Washington, DC that occurred on January 6th, 2021. And the project is gonna combine granular location data. So really, really fine uh, population movement data on more than 40 million mobile devices. Um, so we're gonna combine that with novel measures of neighborhood level voting patterns, the location of organized hate groups, uh, as well as the entire geo-referenced digital archive of the social media platform Parler. Okay. And what we're going to be talking about this, this evening, or perhaps morning, depending on where you are, um, is that we find evidence of partisanship, uh, socio-political isolation, uh, as well as proximity to uh, hate groups and participation in social media. These are all robustly associated uh, with protest participation. Now, I want to point out something, uh, and this is just like the, for the teacher in me pointing this out, but we want to be really careful when we use this language of causation versus correlation. What I'm going to show you is a really robust correlation, right? but we can't say definitively whether or not it's causal. Now, there are a few things that we're going to talk about later on. Uh, hopefully, we'll have a chance to talk about them, where we can think about them in a causal way. Uh, but for now, let's just think about the fact that these are very, very robust, meaningful correlations in the data, okay? And hopefully what this research does, um, and it has since we released it uh, more than a year ago, is, is to fill a gap in the way that we study collective action. And the gap is that up until uh, the tool that we used, it was incredibly difficult to think about measuring uh, both where protests are occurring in real time as well as, and perhaps more meaningfully, who actually participated uh, in these mass scale events. Okay. All right, so, so a bit of a roadmap. I'm gonna give you guys a brief sketch of this literature on protest, uh, including uh, prior attempts to measure participation, um, as well as introducing our particular measures for thinking about both protest sites and participation. We'll talk a little bit about the context as well as things that we've done to benchmark the models that we've produced. And we're gonna think about how we can uh, evaluate evidence linking participation uh, in the January 6th event uh, to partisanship and polarization. Okay. All right, so a little bit about this, this previous literature. So prior work uh, has studied when and where protests, riots, and armed opposition movements emerge. And they thought a lot about the role of economic conditions. So is it, for example, a negative economic shock or economic dislocation that leads to a swell in protest activity? It could be that political repression leads to an increase in protests and riots, as well as perhaps the exclusion of racial, ethnic, or economic minorities. Now, all of these factors, including use of force and the role of social media and misinformation or disinformation, they can all shape uh, when and where protests emerge. And this prior work has thought about what is the impact of these protests once they actually do emerge. And so they've thought about the role of collective action in shaping political reforms, uh, in influencing voting patterns in subsequent elections, and shaping social attitudes and community cohesion after protests uh, or riots have occurred. And they've also thought about how you know, protests, riots, and other forms of collective action uh, 
have influenced the subsequent economic development, right? And so this is all just a long-winded way of saying, studying protests, both when they occur, why they occur, and what their subsequent impacts are, is a really, really important subject uh, for social scientists and for folks like you and me who've been thinking about public policy challenges and ultimately uh, folks who are interested in studying um, and uh, ultimately shaping policy uh, that's motivated by those protests, okay? And so I wanna be clear, we think of these as being really important contributions, um, but what we know significantly less about are the individuals and micro level communities uh, that participate in protests and riots, um, as well as other forms of, of political violence. And so a significant literature on when they occur, where they occur and what their consequences are, but um, a perhaps less robust set of evidence on who actually participates uh, in these events, okay? And, and this, this is a set of tricky questions, right? Because it, it raises this thought of like, how exactly should we be measuring uh, participation? It's really difficult to characterize individuals or small scale communities engaged in collective action in both a rigorous and representative way. So what prior approaches have done is to focus typically on ethnographic research. And so this is when uh, individuals are embedded in small scale communities, they can track their participation in events over time, or they can use survey-based approaches. So they will actually go to a protest site uh, or a location where a movement is meeting and will begin asking questions about who the participants are. And so if they ask direct questions about participation in any given event, uh, there are naturally a, a series uh, of issues that this raises. One, uh, there is selection on the dependent variable, which means that we can only, in either of these approaches, uh, study participation conditional on participation. Right? So we don't have any zeros, we only have ones. Um, it raises questions about representativeness, right? So an ethnographic approach is gonna usually be uh, gathering a really small sample, uh, but with a survey-based approach, which might have a larger sample, there are naturally questions about social desirability bias, uh, as well as preference falsification. So what this means is that when you ask people direct questions about a sensitive topic, they won't always tell you the truth. And sometimes they have an incentive to falsify their real preference, right? And tell you the opposite. And so it begins uh, to be really, really difficult um, to think about why participation occurs or who's actually participating uh, because there are often incentives to, to lie. Okay. And so there are perhaps ways to, to think about making progress on this question of who participates if we move away from individual level participation. And so what you can do in this case and what prior work has done is to compare areas with and without protests or riots or other form of political violence. Um, and, and what this does is, is it actually allows you to look at the event location and use potentially really granular data, but the validity of that approach hinges on how close the people are to their home, right? And so if an event occurs, like for example, a large scale march occurs, um, it's actually really difficult to identify where individuals are from. They could be from the same city, but they could also be uh, reside elsewhere inside of the same state, or they could actually be crossing state or provincial lines, um, or maybe even international borders to actually go to one of these protests. And so uh, what this means is, this particular approach is only going to work uh, if those who are engaged in protests or other activities reside in the area where the protest or riot occurs. Uh, but that's often not gonna be the case, uh, especially because collective action, especially large scale events are gonna be coordinated around landmarks, right? Um, and this is really gonna complicate the study of, of mass scale events like the January 6th event. Uh, a very, very few people uh, who participated in the January 6th event were actually coming from Washington, D.C. proper, coming from the area immediately around the, the Capitol building, okay? And so, you know, why, why is this uh, important? Well, of course, there are these important uh, academic and policy relevant questions that are difficult to answer if we don't have better measures, right? So we can't begin thinking about 
uh, geographic clustering if we don't have a good measure of who actually goes to these events. We can't think about the role of partisanship and polarization if people are traveling significant distances in order to get to the event, because we can't actually think about where they're from um, unless they're coming from a specific site of the event itself. And of course, there are a series of other questions that we can't really answer uh, unless we have better measures. And so in order to, to sort of think about potential solutions to events like January 6th, one of the sort of dominant narratives uh, in the mainstream media has been, well, if we knew who the participants were, we could think about ways of combating disinformation right, or engaging in counter messaging. But again, the only way to understand clustering, to think about the role of partisanship, to think about the role of isolation or proximity to this group or that group or the role of social media is if you actually know who participates. And this up until now has been one of the most important gaps in our understanding of collective action, right? And so that's where our project comes in. And we're hoping that we can, we can make some progress on this. And so the, the project has effectively three parts. Part one is a method for identifying the locations of protest sites. Part two is a method for once we know where protest sites occur, how can we identify or estimate community level participation? And part three is a particular application to the insurrection. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about part one and then you're gonna see, it turns out we actually don't even need this for the particular case uh, that we're gonna talk about. And so what we do is we begin by thinking about how can we estimate protest sites using mobile device data? And so uh, what we rely on is anonymous, aggregated data from a panel of 40 million mobile devices uh, spread across the United States. And so I wanna clarify what the data is. So the data is aggregated from raw GPS pings uh, from an underlying demographically representative sample of input devices drawn from thousands of data merchants. So the way to, to think about this is um, if you have Angry Birds on your phone or you have TikTok or you have Twitter or you have Facebook or you have ever given any app permissions uh, to use your location information, probably on this call right now, almost every one of us has done this at some point, right? Then your data as an anonymized device uh, is actually in here, okay? And of course, we're not using the individual level data, we're using aggregated data that is fully anonymized. Uh, and, and that's why what we're doing is, is focusing on the community level, okay? And so our use case is twofold. One, we're gonna talk about uh, device surges, uh, which is our methodology. And then in this particular case, we're actually gonna show that the device surges in Washington, DC occurred at exactly the site where the January 6th event happened, okay? And so in order to think about measuring surges, what this is, is just a large and anomalous number of devices begin passing through uh, a micro scale geography across the United States. And so imagine if you were to split up the United States into hundreds of thousands of neighborhoods. And you could understand where devices were moving through time, through these neighborhoods, then you could develop an algorithm to tell you what is normal traffic like in this particular place. And then what is traffic like in any given window of time, okay? And so for now, let's think about a window of time as being a day. And what that does is it says that we can look for this really large increase uh, in the number of devices passing through a particular neighborhood. Uh, in, in census language, if any of you all have worked with census data before, this is the census block group. It's sort of a, uh, an intermediate between uh, several of the scales. Um, a typical neighborhood or a typical census block group is gonna have somewhere between 500 or 3000 people residing within it. Um, and so it's a fairly small community, right? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna be able to take this history of movement through particular locations, and we're gonna be able to come up with a threshold value, which what we have found having worked on this quite a, quite a long time is a surge ratio of about 300. And what that means is that the number of devices passing through a particular location is about three times 
uh, what the normal amount should be. Okay. And what this does uh, is it's going to yield an indicator of, of a site um, where these protests could occur. And so what David and I did back in, in 2020, so summer 2020, uh, was to actually use this technique to estimate the location of George Floyd protests. Um, and, and our particular algorithm actually did quite well when we could validate it against uh, tra both traditional media coverage as well as geo hashes associated with social media posts. Okay. And so um, it worked well when we were thinking about really diffuse, uh, a large number of protests. And, and of course, in this particular case, uh, we can, once we know a particular site to look at, we can use information about devices passing through that location on a particular day uh, to back out participation in the origin community. Okay. Now, a few things that, that I want to be really clear about. Uh, we don't observe any individual device characteristics, right? And so if you're sitting here now concerned um, that I've somehow hacked your phone, you should not be concerned. Um, neither I nor the comp this particular company are able to do that. Um, it's all anonymized. And in this particular case, it's all aggregated. So there's no uniquely identifying information. So your data is safe. Um, however, we can look at devices as they move through space uh, and trace them back to the community where that device typically resides, okay? And so if you happen to find yourself residing around uh, campus of the University of Chicago, there are a set of census block groups around the Keller building, okay? Um, and effectively what this would do is it would enable us to, to identify movement both through those census block groups as well as to trace De, uh, devices passing through back to their community of origin, okay? And here's the important thing. Right? If you remember the conversation that we had a little bit earlier was focused on why it's so important to be able to measure where people are coming from. It's because it is often the case that people will travel very large distances uh, in order to get to a particular event. And as it turns out, this approach means uh, distance doesn't matter as long as, again, in this particular case, uh, that individual is not traveling across international boundaries, uh, we'll, we would be able to, to uh, estimate their participation, okay? And, you know, we can think about historical traffic and that's exactly why uh, we actually use some of those historical measures. And this allows us to do, address things like the fact that members of Congress routinely go to the Capitol building where these uh, events occurred, their security details, uh, as well as the fact that it's just a high traffic area in general uh, because of tourism. Okay, and so we can correct for all of those things uh, in the way that we in the way that we process the data. And so that data that we have allows us to think about destinations and to think about origin communities. Um, and from that, we can back out a measure of, of community level participation. Now the question is, well, once you have that, what else can you do, right? Because now you have this incredibly granular map across hundreds of thousands of neighborhoods across the United States. You can measure participation at the neighborhood level. Uh, what else is, is sufficiently precise that you can actually tie it to that data? And so what we do is we leverage the internet archive of Parler, which, um, was a prominent alt-right social media platform. Uh, it was a tool of mobilization, especially uh, around J6 um, and the post-2020 uh, election protests. And, and so what we leverage is the fact that nearly all of the content on that platform um, could be retrieved through automated scraping, okay? Um, and part of the uh, information that could be scraped were actually almost 70,000 geotagged videos that were posted on the platform. And these were typically self-recorded and they're available going back to, to 2016, okay? And so what this uh, allows us to do is to characterize um, community level engagement with this particular social media platform that for a number of reasons uh, was suspected as, as having played a pivotal role um, in, in J6. Um, we're also going to be able to combine information from the Southern Poverty Law Center on the location of Proud Boy Chapters, uh, which was a, is a far-right neo-fascist hate group, 
Um, and, and for those of you all who were um, watching the debates uh, during the 2020 election, this is the group that Trump told to, to stand back and stand by uh, during one of the presidential debates. Okay, so uh, potentially very large player um, in driving participation in this particular event. And um, this in addition to, to a wealth of, of other data that we can combine. All right. And, and of course, like the back of one of our study is to think about this question of uh, what is the relationship between participation um, in this anti-democratic movement um, and historical voting patterns. Right? And uh, in order to do this, we developed this original sort of algorithm to, to link precincts uh, to the neighborhood where they're located and we can weight uh, voting patterns at the precinct level back to uh, this neighborhood level that aren't always cleanly defined. Um, and this allows us to think about the overlap between these census blocks uh, and precincts, um, in, in which is going to cover about 95% of these cases um, in most of the states. Okay. And effectively, what this allows us to do is to calculate Trump's vote share um, in the origin community. Right? Um, the next step is, is, of course, not just the, the role of, of local partisanship, but whether or not there's a role of political isolation. Right? And what this means is um, a Trump voting community that is surrounded by similarly Trump voting communities um, might not be as mobilized um, because concerns about external threat might not be as severe as in cases where a similarly Trump voting community uh, is surrounded by um, communities that voted for Hillary Clinton in the 2016 election. Right? So that's a way of thinking about political isolation is, is your proximity um, to folks that didn't vote for the same presidential candidate as you. Okay? And so what we do here is we can use what's called Queen's adjacency uh, to identify the communities that form this exterior shell around these micro scale neighborhoods. And then for each of these neighborhoods, we can calculate the share of voting um, for, the same, for, for Donald Trump in 2016. And we can then compare uh, the neighborhood versus its neighbors okay? and, and calculate isolation. And so, you know, what, what we do is we can think about um, whether or not these are particular communities are islands, right? In the sense that they are surrounded by communities that are not as extreme as themselves. Um, and it turns out that what we find is that there are actually quite a few communities um, that would be classified as islands. So they are politically isolated uh, across the spectrum. Right, um, of local community support. All right, and so a little bit about our results. So first off, I told you we, we've got this method for thinking about protest sites, uh, and it turns out that our particular approach can actually do can actually do a really good job of identifying these sites. And so if you were to use our methodology for using uh, mobile device data to identify where an event occurred in space and time. Uh, it turns out to overlap exactly with um, the area where this particular JSEX event occurred on that day, okay? And so that's that's helpful, okay? And once we actually know which, which CBGs experienced surges during that time, what we can do is we can then backtrace devices to their community of origin. Now, again, we're not doing this at the individual device level. Instead, we're doing this at the neighborhood level. Okay, and what you end up with is this. Okay, so um, this map, uh, if, if you were using the current approach to uh, estimating protest participation, it should be really, really scary, right? Um, because if we were to think about protest participation as being driven by activities, events, or characteristics in the area where the protest is occurring, what you're going to miss out on is that there are thousands of communities that were represented um, in those devices that showed up in DC and passed through the site of uh, the protest and subsequent riot. Okay. And so each of these blue lines um, is going to link back to an origin community that participated um, across the United States. Now, in some ways, this is um, a fair critique of this is that, well, you're just capturing population density across the United States. 
right? Um, and to a certain extent, that's fair. Um, but actually, there are some very sparsely populated areas that are dramatically overrepresented. So uh, think in particular about what's happening in our in our neighbor neighboring state of Michigan. There is significant overrepresentation of very sparsely populated areas uh, in that state. So this is not a necessarily a population map of, of what's happening there. Um, and in fact, the nice part about being able to take the approach that we've taken um, is that we can explicitly model the role of population um, in shaping these trends. All right, and so what, do, what does our, our regression-based evidence tell us? Well, it tells us that uh, participation is uh, increasing in Trump vote share. I'm gonna show you the actual results here in a second. Um, there is then a marginal effect of isolation, which is to say that um, isolation amplifies the effect of local partisanship. So the more isolated the community is, the closer it is to political rivals, the greater the effect of local partisanship. Okay. Um, participation also increases the closer a community is uh, to a Proud Boys chapter. And it's also going to increase with local parlor use. And, and to be clear, we're measuring parlor use before the insurrection. Okay. Um, and it's going to, to hold across a, a series of, of quite demanding specifications, uh, including accounting, for example, for population, uh, as well as local demographic characteristics. Okay. Now, for those of you all who are, some of you all might already be at Harris, or you're thinking about a program at Harris, or you've been admitted, um, and you're mentally preparing for what you're about to spend the next couple of years thinking about, um, this, this hopefully isn't too scary, okay? Um, I'm gonna walk you through it. I'm gonna tell you exactly what all these numbers mean, okay? All right, so for this first set of, of figures, you should notice that um, participation, so this is the number of protesters, right? Um, and so we're gonna call, this is a, a measure of protest because we can't disentangle who the protesters were and who the rioters were. So we're gonna pull them together. Um, the amount of protest participation is significantly increasing in Trump vote share, right? So we can interpret this as local partisanship. Um, there are other ways that you can interpret that, but I'll, I'll leave the politics to the side. Um, and then whether or not that's an island, you'll notice that if we interact island with Trump vote share, it has this very, very large positive effect. And so this is that amplification, right? So even in communities that aren't isolated, um, partisanship has an effect. But among communities that are politically isolated, that effect is even larger, okay? Which is, uh, and the magnitude of this is actually quite shocking. Okay, uh, and so that's gonna hold in this first set of results. Um, it's also gonna hold if we have what are called state level fixed effects. And so in our model, we can account for all of the characteristics that are fixed by, uh, that remain the same across the state, uh, but may actually differ across them. And, and the result is still there. And of course, we can also think not just about uh, accounting for differences in, um, across states, but we can also think about accounting for differences across counties we can do this as well. And again, the results are, are, are quite robust, okay? Um, other things to, to have a look at. So as the distance is, is increasing, participation is going down. So distance to the closest Proud Boys chapter, it's going down. Uh, same thing here if we have state level fixed effects. This begins to be really tricky for us to think about within county um, because the distances are gonna be strongly correlated within county. So we wouldn't expect anything here, and, and in fact, we don't see it. Um, but as local parlor use is increasing, so again, participation in the social media um, is increasing, you get these very, very large effects on participation. So um, parlor participation is very strongly correlated uh, with subsequent protest participation, right? And you know, in the cross section or within state, we don't see any large effects for, for household income. Um, but once you look within county, right, there is a quite substantial effect um, and, and it's positive, which means that the higher the median income in the neighborhood, 
the more participation um, in protests. And so this isn't terribly surprising, right? I think to some folks, um, it might come as a, as a little bit of a surprise to think that uh, the folks that are doing the best, right, um, are the most likely to engage in an event like this, um, but that turns out to be uh, exactly what we see, okay? All right, and so of course, if you, um, if you have a chance, uh, to have a look at the paper, there's actually quite a bit more that we're able to do, right? And so there are a bunch of different ways that you could think about slicing this measure of participation. Uh, there are a bunch of additional uh, model parameters that we could add. We could think about using different base periods for calculating the correction on our participation measure. There are uh, ways of accounting for the role of, of Washington, D.C., so participation uh, from CPGs within Washington, DC, as well as thinking about the fact that across space, there's gonna be a lot of what's called autocorrelation, okay? So uh, if there's participation in my neighborhood, uh, odds are there's gonna be participation nearby. There are ways of accounting for that that we have also tried to do. Okay, so what are some of the insights from this particular study? Um, so hopefully you've had a chance to, to think about why it's so important for us to be able to measure who actually goes to these events, whether or not it's a protest, uh, fighting for racial equality, or a protest that ends up being a riot uh, in support of, of an anti-democratic change in government. Um, it's really important for us to be able to think about and characterize uh, community, at least community level participation uh, in these mass scale events. And so we developed a couple of methods for thinking about that, we applied them specifically to, to the January 6th event. And what our approach clarifies uh, is effectively a profile of neighborhood level participation. And what these results suggest um, is that participation in no small part was driven by or robustly associated with local partisanship as well as political isolation. Okay, so thanks again for for coming. Uh, really excited to, to hear your thoughts. Uh, and of course, happy to talk about more than, than just this particular project. So thank you. Professor, thank you so much. We have some questions that came in through the chat. So I just want to let everybody know, as a reminder, if you have questions, um, please send them in. Um, I'll start with Josh's question. Josh was asking, did you test your methods, for example, identifying protest location via phone data for robustness against other protests and or riots? Yeah, so this is good. So Josh, thanks for the question. And, uh, and indeed we did. So I didn't tell you very much about the intellectual origins of this project, but the project actually began long before January 6th. Um, and that's because the project that uh, we originally developed this algorithm for was to identify the location of George Floyd protests, right? And so uh, that involved uh, thinking about identifying the locations of um, more than a thousand events that occurred. If we think about each location by day, uh, more than a thousand events um, in the data, right? And so, yes, we, we, tried, to, we tried to do that and and the results fared quite well for thinking about those particular events. Yeah, um, and I'm happy to clarify more about why we didn't pursue that project um, if it's of interest as well. All right, a couple other questions coming in. Um, I'm sorry if I pronounce your name wrong, Rashid. R square is pretty low across all specifications. Does that point to some other factors which may explain participation in the insurrection? Ooh, very, very good question. Um, it suggests that there's a lot of unexplained variation, right? And so the fact that the R squared is low tells us that our model is capturing some, but certainly not all of the variation. Um, and it's a little tricky to think about R squared uh, in this particular case, um, when we're comparing the cross section and then the state level fixed effects and the county level fixed effects. Um, again, because there, there are so many factors that could be influential um, and and we, we focused on these, but um, of course, if, if you have more ideas, I'm always happy to throw more into the model and, and see what comes out. Okay. Another question, Jamie is asking, should we be familiar with the regression tables as we saw the results before coming to Harris? I'd like to know more about how to interpret the bivariate regression analysis. Good. All right. So this is also a very nice question. Um, the answer is no, you shouldn't be familiar with how to read it. 
Um, if you are, then that's that's wonderful, right? Um, but if you aren't, that's actually one of the things that, that we teach you, right? Um, because our expectation um, is that as you come in, um, you are motivated to learn and you're excited to use the best available quantitative tools um, to actually study these problems, right? And if you're motivated to learn, even if you haven't had any prior exposure to this content, that's why we have a stats core, right? Um, and I teach stats too. Uh, so the second in the sequence, which is actually when you're uh, first introduced to both bivariate and multivariate regression. And quite a bit of what we focus on in our class in the early weeks is how do you read a regression table like that? So um, you absolutely shouldn't feel stumped if you don't know what that means. Um, that's our job uh, is to help you learn that. A few other questions we have. Um, Professor, do you have any recommendations on things students should read or listen to before they come to Harris, either textbooks or just other things that might help them prepare to maybe think a little bit differently um, or prepare for you Chicago? Mm -hmm. So recommendations. So I think there's a few that I would suggest. Um, uh, I might be getting the name wrong, but I'm quite certain the name of the book is Thinking Clearly About Data. Um, and uh, it's written by, our, written by some colleagues of ours um, at Harris. And so, you know, a shameless plug for their work, which is actually really excellent. Um, and, you know, if you find yourself in a position where you don't have much prior exposure, um, that is the first book that I would recommend that you pick up. Um, it's going to walk you all the way from thinking about simple, prob thinking about simple problems um, to, yeah, thinking clearly with data. Um, and uh, to, to thinking about more advanced problems, right? How do we think, you know, like we talked about, right? This is what we can learn here is about robust correlations in the data, but we can't actually ascertain the causal effect of partisanship, right? Because, and, and I think this is, you know, Rachi, this is an excellent point about, there are still other factors out there that explain participation. And perhaps those other factors um, are, are confounders, right? Um, and, and those are reasons why we don't want to overinterpret uh, those particular results. And then absolutely. So, uh, you know, Ethan Buenardo Mesquita, who's one of the co one of the authors of that book, uh, teaches in the analytical politics core. And so if you're starting in the fall, he'll be he'll be one of the faculty member members that you uh, that you're going to engage with in the fall. Uh, and then Anthony Fowler, you know, again, uh, phenomenal faculty member at Harris. Um, you might not have very many opportunities to interact with him in the core, um, but uh, as you take other coursework in a year or two, you might have that opportunity. And if you do, highly, highly recommended, um, extraordinarily sharp um, and, and kind person as well. And you can also find, I'll send the link, Professor Fowler is on the Not Another Politics podcast with some of our other faculty members too. So sometimes students are interested in that. Um, another question that we have, Professor, could you talk a little bit for those students who are interested in DPSS and the capstone project and research, what might their capstone projects look like in, in comparison to some of this research that you showed today? Yeah. So. Um... You know, one of the, one of the things that, right? So so uh, DPSS um, is a program that I started a few years ago um, that we've had the great fortune of seeing like really expand. Um, and one of the, at least from my perspective as like the director, one of the most exciting parts about the program uh, is seeing students be able to pick up some of these baseline skills uh, that we typically teach in the core, and actually apply them in a capstone, which is a research project. And the overlap between the capstone project and, and this, the one that you saw right now, um, is actually pretty substantial. Um, last summer, our students actually used some of the aggregated movement data from the same provider that we use for our project um, to study the effects of um, mask mandate reversal on foot traffic through stores, right? And so you might be wondering why in the world would anyone ever want mobile device data? Um, 
and uh, certainly not for projects like uh, the one that I just showed you now, that's not going to be the primary use case. Instead, the primary use case for data like that is folks want to know um, how much time are you spending at Target versus Walmart, right? Um, and when what students did last summer uh, is again use the same input data that we use for this project uh, to study the effects of firm level decisions about whether or not to reverse or implement mask mandates on, on subsequent foot traffic through stores, right? Which is like a, a really important question in, in micro. Yeah. And so that's one of these projects. Of course, like um, for those of you all who have had the, the chance to, to sort of walk, stumble through my website, you'll see most of my work is not on the United States. Um, it's on other countries. Um, and it's usually um, on uh, contexts that are, are weakly institutionalized, uh, fragmented, or at risk. And um, that's because I mostly work on political violence um, in places like uh, Afghanistan and Iraq and, and Colombia. And uh, of course, like those kinds of projects are also reflected in, in some of those capstone opportunities that students have been able to engage with um, using, using data that I use in other projects. Sorry, I was furiously sending some links to the chat <laughs> as you as you were talking, Professor. So I think we have answered all of the questions that have come in. I do want to note that if any of you here are a student who is admitted or applying to our full time degree programs, either for this year or for next year. But what Professor Wright has mentioned about DPSS is something that's of interest to you. You can just email Harris Admissions and we can talk to you about pursuing the full-time programs, but if you wanted to do DPSS beforehand, what that might look like. We've had numerous students who've done that, so we're happy to, to talk students through that, especially students always ask, what should they be doing over the summer to prepare? How can they get ready for school? So any anyone who has questions about that, just email Harris Admissions, and me or my colleagues will be happy to talk you through, you know, working with both programs. Professor, my, my last question for you is, do you have any advice or recommendation for students as they're thinking about graduate at school and preparing um, for future study? Oh, you saved the, the hard question for last year. Um, <laughs> I, don't know. I thought I, some of the questions about R were a little hard for me. But. Yeah, no, no, no. Okay, so actually, so actually, I do, I think that the, um, you know, if, you, if you're, you know, you might be on the fence about whether or not you're going to do something like our summer program, or you're thinking about graduate school and you're not quite certain what that path is going to be like. You know, one thing I would I would strongly, strongly encourage you to think about is that a lot of what we talked about today, I tend to think of as a fundamental life skill, right? And um, and in particular, the role of coding and programming, right? Like none of the work that you saw me talk about would have been possible in the absence of the ability to, to code. And a lot of what you see, um, in, in journalistic coverage, right? Um, uh, and, and any work that you've engaged with um, as a student, right? A lot of that is, is leveraging the power of, of programming. And in particular, you know, not to say that I'm, I'm out here sort of gonna trumpet one particular platform, but I will say that if you're gonna master one platform, I'd recommend R. Right, it's, it's open source, it's free, and Tidyverse is an incredibly engaged and supportive community. Um, and uh, if you can't find an answer there, um, you're either not looking hard enough, or you can be the person that fundamentally shifts that community by finding an answer to whatever important question there is yet answered. Okay. Um, and so that's what I would suggest as you think about like this path is that you find the place that's going to teach you the skills that are going to enable you to be the best version of yourself. And I think honestly, one of the best ways for you to improve um, your value, you know, within an organization, uh, but also frankly, like your, the, your ability to contribute as a person, right, as a human um, in this process is, is learn how to program, learn how to code. 
All right, that covers our masterclass and our session. Thank you so much for your time. You're on leave. I so appreciate it. Thank, I know you have so much going on. So thank you so much. And thank you everyone for tuning in and asking such great questions. There is a recording available. So for those of you who missed it or you wanna look at something again, just email Harris Admissions for any questions. And thank you again so much, Professor. Have a good evening. All right, take care everyone. Great to see you and hope to see you again soon.